Hello, this is Dr. Amber Hughes. Welcome to Counseling Ethics Lecture 2. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the moral principles that are the foundation of our code of ethics. So these six moral principles are kind of the guiding light for our ethical codes. Um, they are, they form the basis um, for, like, we talk, like I talked about in the last lecture, they form the basis for um, kind of our, our, our cultural norms that are uh, involved with the counseling and the helping professions. Okay. For each of these, I'm going, they're pretty easy to understand, uh, in terms of de definition. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define them, but then I'm also going to give an example, uh, and uh, kind of a case example and, um, ask you to think about it. So what I'll do is I'll give the example and then I'll pause. So here I won't pause for a long time, but I'll pause long enough to allow you to pause if you want to kind of think things through on your own before I talk through the, um, the response or the, um, the things you should consider with each example. All right. The first one is respect for autonomy. So counselors should respect the rights of clients to make their own decisions, choose their own direction and control their own lives. Counselors strive to de decrease dependence on the counselor and increase independence or autonomy. So I think I mentioned in the last lecture uh, that our goal for counseling is really for our clients to, um, uh, to facilitate our clients' growth and, and to encourage them to become independent and, and able to um, function health in a healthy way on their own. Um, we don't want to make them dependent on us. Uh, sometimes that's hard though, because sometimes our clients want us to make decisions for us. And so we really have to strive to um, help increase those, uh, their independence. Uh, an example is um, Robbie has been working with her 17 year old client Adnan for months. Adnan is trying to decide what he should do after graduating from high school. Adnan doesn't want to go to college, but Robbie is trying to convince him otherwise. Is Robbie respecting Adnan's autonomy? Now here's where you can pause if you want to think about this. Um, no, she's not, right? Uh, and so so this sounds pretty straightforward probably um, because we're really uh, trying to encourage our clients to, um, uh, to make their own decisions, right? And so we're trying to help them with that process, not necessarily with the outcome right? The decision itself. However, um, as someone who's worked with high school and college students, it can, uh, it can be hard to separate yourself because, uh, you know, as people who are, uh, in college, um, who have higher education, um, education is something we value. And we also know statistically that you're, you're likely to find a better paying job. Um, if you have some sort of higher education, whether it's training, um, technical training or, you know, an associate's or bachelor's degree. And so, um, we might encourage that knowing, uh, just, just wanting what's best for our client. Um, but we have to be careful of balancing that, um, wanting what's best with our, for our client with, uh, um, putting our own, um, uh, uh, decisions and values on the client to kind of encourage them to make the decision that we want. Uh, the next one is non-maleficence. Uh, counselors work to avoid harm to clients. Okay. Uh, again, this one's easy and really straightforward. We, forward. we don't want to harm our clients, right? That's not what we're here to do. Um, but listen to this example. So Tim is a white man working with Serena, an African-American woman. Serena recently disclosed that she feels discriminated against at work. Tim isn't sure he believes Serena and encourages her not to think like a victim. Is Tim unintentionally doing harm to Serena? pause if you wish. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he is unintentionally doing harm to Serena, right? So he's not, um, advocating for her. He's not acknowledging her feelings. He's not, uh, acknowledging, um, you know, social justice issues, uh, racism, institutionalized racism. So those are all things, um, he may feel like he's, you know, really, uh, uh doing what he should be by not encouraging, by encouraging her to not think like a victim and, and, and and empowering her, her. Um, but, uh, what he's doing is, um, kind of upholding that institutionalized racism, right. By encouraging her to, uh, not speak about it. Right. Um, and so, uh, I think this is a good example because with a lot of, um, like cultural and racial issues, um, counselors, 
in general, I feel like are, uh, we're helpers and we want to help our clients, right? Um, so we have good intentions. It's just that sometimes these issues, um, are things that we're not aware of. And so they can, uh, they, they happen like microaggressions, right? Microaggressions, which I'll talk about in a later, uh, later lecture in more depth, but microaggressions are they're like little pin pricks, right? Like they're, they're, they're things we say, we don't intend to say them, but they cause harm. Okay. So that's what happens a lot of times with non-maleficence. It's not that we're intentionally harming clients, it's that we're unintentionally harming clients. And so these things can, um, can happen without us being aware of it. Okay. And um, so it's important to, uh, to do your own work, to do your own self-reflection, um, so that we can avoid, avoid doing harm to clients. Beneficence. So this is where we try to do good for clients, okay? It's the opposite of male maleficence, non-maleficence, right? Um, but it goes hand in hand with it at the same time. So uh, with benef beneficence, we're trying to, again, do good for clients. So again, here's an example. Um, Lucille's client, Hannah, stated that she met a boy online from California. She told Lucille that she bought a bus ticket to California to go meet this boy. She leaves this weekend. Hannah, a 14-year-old, begged Lucille not to tell her parents. Lucille decided to uphold confidentiality and keep this information to herself. Is Lucille taking the best action for Hannah's good? I don't know. Right. So this is this is a, an example of an ethical dilemma. And with an ethical dilemma, there is no right answer. And a lot of times we'll see with ethical dilemmas that um, two uh, two of these moral principles are in conflict with one another. Right. So to uphold one, we have to break another. So this is one example. Um, there is not necessarily a, a right answer, but this is something that um, um, would present a moment where you're having to make a decision whether you're going to uphold confidentiality or um, to break confidentiality to to do good for the client and um, to keep her safe. So so Hannah, in you know, in my opinion, is putting herself at, at danger, potentially extreme danger, right? Because um, human trafficking is is a huge issue, um, and so she's potentially putting herself in extreme danger. And so Lucille has decided uh, not to do good for her client in order to uphold confidentiality. Justice. So um, counselors commit to treating people equally and fairly. Uh, however, this does not mean that counselors treat all people the same. Okay. Um, so if we're treating people, uh, treating people the same, we may not be treating people equally or fairly because people, um, depending on, on what's going on with them, they need um, different um, different treatment, right? So for example, June is leading a group for individuals who have lost a loved one. One of the group members is from Mexico and English is her second language. While she can speak English fluently, it takes her a little bit of time to process and understand when people are speaking quickly, especially in a group setting. Uh, June makes sure that this group member is understanding everyone's statements. And so she takes time in between uh, responses to uh, to check out with the client and make sure she's understanding. Uh, June also is very intentional about giving this member plenty of time to process um, these responses and then to to uh, formulate her own response because um, it does take her a little bit more time to to process this information. Is June treating this group member justly? She is. So she is giving her um, what some may consider more special treatment, um, but it's really just to help her um, appreciate and, and uh, get as much out of the group as everyone else, right? So it's, it's putting her, this extra time is putting her more on a level playing field with everyone else um, because she needs that extra time to process. Fidelity. Um, counselors honor commitments and keep promises. Uh, again, it seems pretty straightforward and, and, and um, uh, something that we should do, right, as counselors. This doesn't just mean for uh, our clients, though. It also means for um, our colleagues and other people in the profession. So, for example, Carlos agreed to co-lead a domestic violence workshop with a fellow counselor for helping professionals in the community. On the day of the workshop, he's really tired and stressed out. He doesn't think he'll, he'll do a, a really good job great job with this uh, workshop. So he decides to skip it and texts his co-leader to, co to let her know he won't be there. Is Carlos maintaining fidelity? No, he's not, right? And so he committed to putting on this workshop. Um, and maybe if he had decided, you know, a week in advance, if he had found someone else to take his place, uh, those might have been ways to allow him to maintain fidelity 
and to keep his promise of of helping out with this workshop but um to back out on the day of i would say no he's not um he's not maintaining fidelity in this instance and the final one is veracity. So counselors deal honestly with clients and others in the profession. So for example, um, Sharon recently completed her master's program in counseling. She's applied for her LPCA to begin her residency, but is waiting to hear back for the approval from the board. Sharon currently is working as a counselor under supervision. Um, so she's, you know, she's at a job, she's being supervised, she's doing counseling. Um, however, all of her clients are under the impression that Sharon is a licensed counselor. Is Sharon presenting herself honestly to her clients? Um, no, she's not. Uh, so especially when it comes to certifications and licensure, um, it's important that we make sure our clients understand who we are and, and why these things are important. Uh, and so Sharon should be um, letting her clients know and being very clear with her clients where she's at in the process, um, that she's applied for residency, that she is, you know, she, she has a job as a counselor and she's under supervision, but she's um, not been approved by the board yet. It's just, it's simply a matter of, of informed consent. It's a matter of informing clients uh, of things that are their right to know. Um, it's, it, in this instance, it's also important to, to explain things to them because we can tell clients things, um, but unless they, you know, if they, unless they speak the language, so to speak, unless they speak the counseling language, they may not understand what it means to be licensed and certified and all those things. And so it's important to be very clear and use understandable language and to explain um, the, the process and the system that we work within so that they understand. And that's it. Those are the moral principles um, that guide our code of ethics, along with some examples to, to kind of help you better understand those.